Wow, thank you so much. That was amazing. I didn't realize I was going to join the choir by sitting there. I certainly got a stare when I started to sing along. <laughs> but thank you very much. If you all up there want to see them, you have to come back at 3 o'clock when they're going to perform for us a wonderful concert. So thank you so much. Beautiful song and fits in so well with our theme today. And we're going to hear something about that theme as Mary comes and reads to us Psalm 85. It's taken from Psalm 85. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin, Selah. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation. 
and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, you speak to us through your word, and so we invite you to come and speak to us through this Psalm 85, a psalm that speaks to into our situation as individuals and as a nation. So speak to us, we pray, in Christ's holy name. Amen. Well, a long, 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 long time ago, back in 1992, which I don't think even some of you were born in, back in the UK, we were having a pretty tough time. In later on the year, we had something called Black Wednesday, when the sterling currency was removed from the exchange rate mechanism because it couldn't be guaranteed not to fall below a certain amount. It cost the country probably more than four billion pounds. It was the year that Prince Charles and Diana announced they would separate. It was the year John Major won uh, an election, a general election against all the odds. Everybody had been predicting a Labour win, but as the leader of the Tory party, he romped home. Much to the dismay of those of us who slit slightly left of centre, it was the fourth time the Tories had won the general election in a row. But the recession was looming. He announced something called Back to Basics, which kind of backfired on him, really. It was all about taking the country back to basics. What was the basic, the, the underpinning of society, family, and family trust and family love? It turned out that most of his, his, his cabinet were enjoying each other's company a little too much. And then on the evening of November the 20th, a fire broke out in the Queen's Chapel of Windsor Castle. It was a devastating and shocking fire, akin to the, the recent fire in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Shocking. The fire destroyed a large section of the ancient castle. It's beautiful oak paneling and roofs dating back to the 17th century. Some of the priceless works of art. And at a a celebration dinner that year to celebrate the Queen's 40th year of coming to the throne of England. She made a speech and she was struggling to make it because she had a, a really heavy cold. And it kind of summed up that year. But she said this, 1992 is not a year which I will look back on with undiluted pleasure. In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis, a horrible year. The country, it seemed, had sunk into some gloom, even depression. And in the midst of economic woes, there were calls for the queen to pay for the castle herself. In the end, she agreed to pay some taxes and open Buckingham Palace to raise money. Uh, which is even better than Disneyland, I can assure you. <laughs> 1992, back in the United Kingdom, an annus horribilis, a horrible year. Things seemed to go from bad to worse, and piled on and piled on stuff. We might think that's happening in, the, in Hong Kong at the moment too, some of us. Is there any end in sight to the protests which take up our weekends and some of our weekdays now? 
Some of those protests, have, as we know, have ended in violent and violent clashes. Will there ever be a return to normal life in Hong Kong, whatever normal is? Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? You know, we read this week flights into Hong Kong from other places across Asia have fallen by nearly 6%. Countries are advising people who come to visit, be careful, be careful. Lawmakers here suggest economic damage is obvious with slumps across various sectors, though how much that is the protests and how much that is this China-US trade war, who can say? But that's how it goes sometimes, isn't it? Something's bad and you think it's bad enough and then something else happens and makes it much worse. And if you're really unlucky, something else as well. Bad news follows bad news. Hardship follows hardship. That's how it goes sometimes. And it's true nationally. It's true personally sometimes too for us in our own lives. We're going through a difficult or dark time and we think it's really bad. And then something else happens. It just makes it even worse. We cry out, where are you, God, in all this? As we've heard other psalmists crying out too in previous weeks as we've gone through the psalms as our preaching series. Now, Psalm 85, the one that Mary read for us today, well, the psalmist is in the midst of a crisis. His nation, his group is in the midst of a, of a crisis. The psalm calls to God to restore, to raise up. It's a psalm written during a period of instability and uncertainty, a tough time in the nation's history. <clears throat> but it's difficult for the people to see the light, to see an end to their troubles. <clears throat> we are destroyed, he writes. We're just so far from what or where we used to be. Everything's in turmoil. We feel downtrodden and despairing. Restore us again, oh God. Verse 4. There is no peace. I am anxious and worried and fearful. Whatever next will happen, God is angry. Must be, laments the psalmist in verse 5a. Will this event ever come to an end? It seems to go on and on and on. Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will it just go on and on or on or will it come to an end? But as with all the Psalms, there is the glimmer of light. There is the shaft of, of hope. And God never leaves himself without that little bit of light, that little bit of hope. And if we look intently, we will find it. We will see it. The stump of Jesse, the shoot coming up between the cracks in the concrete, it's there when we look. So for us here in Hong Kong, when protest follows protest, even to our front door, like today, here in Hong Kong, where the government seems to have few answers to what to do, or in our own lives, when setback follows setback, hardship upon hardship, where is the hope to be found? We turn to this psalm and remind ourselves that God is the God who restores this is God's word to us today. God is the God who restores, who rebuilds, who renews. Our God is the God who is redeeming all things, that he is making a brand new heaven and a brand new earth and inviting us, in fact, making a way for us through the cross to be part of that, to be part of that great renewal, revival and restoration. There are four parts to this psalm. Uh, verses 1 to 3, the community thanks God for past deliverances. Verses 4 to 7, the community calls for renewed deliverance in our day. Verses 8 to 9, the community prays to God uh, that God's word would be revitalized and known amongst the people. And then the end, 10 to 13, the community receives the promises of God's deliverance. So the faith community in the psalmist day is facing a tough time. We don't know what the crisis was. The crisis that gripped them is no longer known to us. Maybe it was that they wanted to return from exile. They were exiles. Maybe they hoped for forgiveness for a national sin 
whatever that might be. Maybe they were enduring a famine and hoped their land would be restored. Their crops would grow again. We're not sure what it is, but in a way that's a good thing because it means that every community suffering or going through a hard time can pray the prayer of this psalm too. A prayer of restoration, of renewal, of revival. To have hope in the present time, the community must remember that they have been here before. There was a crisis before. There was a darkness before. And as we've gone through the Psalms in this Psalm series, the one thing we have remembered is that the psalmist's hope is discovered when they remember back. When they remember how God saved them before. When they remember how God turned things around before. How God restored them or forgave them before. Psalm 33, a couple of weeks ago, the psalmist says, you know, hope in God, hope in God over and over again. And he can hope in God, even in his own crisis, because uh, he says, I remember how we used to go in procession. I remember that. It was wonderful. We used to sing songs to God, and God was there. We rejoiced. We were happy. We were glad. And because of that, even in my present crisis and hardship and difficulty, I am going to hope in God. And I'm never going to give up. So he begins the psalm. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. And I believe, he was saying, you will do it again. I believe you can do it again. And this is a really important theological truth that we find in the Bible, that God just, just doesn't act once. He acts again and again and again and again. And we can trust him. I hope you can testify in your life of faith how God has come to you again and again and again to save, to heal, to restore, to revive. I can. Look back over my life and episodes of my life, the, the dark times, the valleys, the crises. But as I look back, I see how God came to me. And I look back and I remember how we used to be in procession in the great congregation and sing the great hymns. And one day I'll look back to this moment and think the same. What a great time of worship and praise and adoration. When the darkness comes, this will be the light. God acts again and again and again for you and for me. And that's why the psalmist can have hope purpose of remembering what God has done in the past, of knowing both God's actions of law and gospel is to know what God can and will do again. That's where our hope lies, in that confidence. And so verses 4 to 9, the psalmist calls for a kind of renewed deliverance. Restore us again, O God, verse 4. Revive us again, O God, verse 6. As you did it before, do it now. Again and again. You know, we hear that, hear that in Hong Kong and over the border in Shenzhen and other parts of China, various talks are taking place about Hong Kong, about the future, about what is to be done here. Hong Kong University presidents hold admirable town hall meetings and lawmakers try to bridge the, the divide, all to bring an end to the troubles and restore peace to our community. Well, you know what? As the psalmist deep down knows, only real lasting peace and hope will come. Whether it be here or in China or in the UK or the Philippines or France or anywhere else in the world, to individuals, families and communities and churches, it will only come when a revival of the love of God and of a desire to serve God breaks out. When God, through revival, reveals himself powerfully to us, 
to our communities, then will transformation come, real transformation that is more powerful and works beyond political changes. And the brilliant thing about being a Methodist, the wonderful thing about being a Methodist, is that we've actually witnessed it before. God has done it in our community before. Oh, it's a little while ago. But back in England, Methodism came into being out of revival. When God broke out in, in, in England, and when men and women were transformed and transfixed and won over, when their sin was revealed to them, but also how God was saving them. John Wesley, our great founder himself, searching for God, searching for deep meaning, real faith, discovered it May 24, 1738 in London when the Holy Spirit took hold of him, changed his life, and through him and Charles and others changed England, arguably. And revival broke out. People weeping as God came to them. People recognizing the sin that was heavy upon them. And how much they needed God. The holiness of God sort of fell upon the people. And they were overwhelmed. You know, as we said before, the reason we have an open table for communion is because of those days. You don't have to be a Methodist or confirmed or baptized or anything to receive communion from this table. Because in John Wesley's day, when he shared communion, he saw people coming forward to kneel. And they were in tears. They were broken as God touched their lives, revealed their sin but revealed the forgiveness that was available in Jesus. And John Wesley would say, he forgave my sin, even mine. I am the worst sinner, but he forgave my sin. And what we need to pray for, day after day after day after day, in our prayer meetings, beside our beds, wherever we pray, we need to pray for a revival. We need to pray for an outbreaking of the Spirit of God and the, the ways of God to transform us and our lives and the church and society. And that's what the psalmist was praying for. We need a Pentecost all over again in our lives and in the life of the church. So verse 8 let God speak. Listen to what he has to say. His word is peace. Peace to those who fear him, who love him. Uh, and when there is revival of knowledge and love of God, peace will also come. The wonderful things about those people who are suddenly overwhelmed with their sense of sin and separation from God is that they discovered the love of God and that in that discovery came that relief and that peace that filled them as they'd never experienced before. The church, however, doesn't much like revival. It's very hard to control a revival. Methodism came into being because the Church of England could not cope with it, would not accept it. Doors were closed. Preachers kicked out. The church likes order. <laughs> but revival breaks out in God's doing. And then these wonderful phrases at the end of the psalm. Uh, Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground. And righteousness will look down from the sky. There is, uh, in a sense, the language of profound love. Uh, like the song of, song of songs, almost, you know. Steadfast love and faithfulness, keys of salvation will meet righteousness and peace the other aspects of salvation will kiss each other there'll be this unity this coming together and then uh, from the ground up faithfulness will spring and from the sky down righteousness of God his holiness his power will come to be completely enveloped in this new way this new order this new life this new kingdom and that's what this psalmist is talking about So the psalmist 
is in a crisis with his nation, his people. It's darkness and darkness and darkness. Where will the light come? Where will relief come? When will I see it? When will I experience it? But remember, he remembers how God redeemed, how God saved, how God restored once before. And he will do it again. And in that, he will trust. So maybe some of us are going through difficulties in our own lives. And it sometimes feels like it's one thing and then another and another. They seem to come in great numbers sometimes. This is the word for you then. Have hope. Because God who acted before will act again. And for our church and for our nation and all nations, what we need is a great revival. A great revival. And that's what we should be praying for, brothers and sisters, here in Hong Kong, in the Philippines, in the United Kingdom, in every other country we represent today, a revival of God's love and the love of God. The great thing about the awful year of 1992 was that it gave me a job in 1994, because in 1994, I uh, worked throughout the summer in the opening of Buckingham Palace. I was employed as an indoor warden during the summer. And uh, my job was to, with other people, to stand in the, the main state rooms of Buckingham Palace, which look out over the back of the palace and on the gardens. And uh, one day I was in the big uh, picture gallery, which is like a long spine of that part of the palace, rooms opening off on both sides. But the main uh, picture gallery houses some of the 7,000 pieces of art that the Queen or the, uh, the Royal Collection has from its one million objects. And uh, uh, at the end of the uh, gallery, and some of you will know that gallery because it's the place where we watch world leaders going for state visits. They are shown things from their countries. You know, Trump was there recently for a state dinner. So the queen was sort of showing him, look, what we stole from you 200 years ago. <laughs> it's here, you can't have it, hands off. <laughs> uh, or this, or that. Um, uh, that's the picture gallery. And at the end of the picture gallery, there are two beautiful uh, Ming vases, blue. And uh, one is perfect on one side, beautiful. And on the other, it's been clearly smashed at some point. And it looks like it's been rather badly put together. It's look, it looks like the kind of restoration that I would do, where you take all the bits with a tube of glue and sort of stick it together. It doesn't seem to quite fit, but you shove it in anyway. That's what it looks like. It's quite shocking to see. And uh, when, when the master of the household was uh, going by once and I was standing in that area, I did say to him before we opened, I said, what's the story of this vase? Why does it look so awful? <laughs> And he said, well, actually, it's, it's in the correct position. Every piece is in the correct position. But uh, there's, you know, there's an argument or theories that go on bef between restorers and conservationists. You know, some people think that if something gets broken, you should take it and do whatever is necessary to make it look exactly as it looked before. So you have to add things, you have to change it, drill things. You know, we could restore it exactly. You would never know. But the conservationists say to us, no, no, no. No, just stick it back together as perfectly as we can because this is the history of this vase now. Somebody broke it. We used to make up stories about Prince William driving his car into it and breaking it. Probably wasn't true. <laughs> I'm sure the Queen knocked it over. Uh, but there it is. So we have these two vases. If you ever get to go to Buckingham Palace, you should all go. It's an amazing place. Uh, two vases, waist height, Ming, blue Ming. One perfect, the other badly seems put together. Now, God is about restoration. But God is not like the conservationist who puts, it, puts us together with all these cracks and badly formed. God is the God who restores perfectly. God is the God who is restoring all things, heaven and earth, of which we are a part. And when we get to heaven, we will be presented blameless, unblemished, perfect, because of what Christ has done 
on the cross for you and for me. We are being restored. We are being remade. And that's why we have hope in our lives in the darkness. And that's why we have hope for Hong Kong. Because even the tumultuous events that are happening for us here or even in the Philippines, God, we believe, is at work. God is at work restoring and redeeming and renewing. And so we can have hope. So let's pray. Let's pray for a revival of God's love and mercy and forgiveness. Let's pray that a revival will break out in this church, in Hong Kong. Because only that will truly transform a society. We as Methodists look back. And say, yeah, we remember God. We remember when you did it in England. You changed lives. Thousands upon thousands of people came to faith. And it transformed society. It transformed England. Come and do it again, oh God. Come and do it in our time. And not just for the young, but as Alison has reminded us, for the elderly who are isolated and lonely. For every person. Here, may there be an outbreak of revival. And oh God, I pray, let it begin with me, in my life, in my heart. Amen. We're going to sing a song that reminds us about how God's name is to be restored in our society, in our time. Restore, O oh Lord, the honor of your name. We're going to remain seated as we sing this and then uh, Lord Diva is going to come and pray. Oh, Anne is going to come and pray.